let's see what happens. Hinduism, the fourth and probably final in our series of world religions. Did mine do that? Sorry. Um, so here we are. We're going from MIT to India, of course, the birthplace of Hinduism. At this point, uh, in deference to my partner, Patrick Hoy, I'm going to say Hinduism is a word that is made up in the 17th or 18th century uh, by Europeans to uh, refer to something that has been going on since, oh my God, so long. Uh, we don't know how long it's been going on. Um, so in deference to uh, his input, I'm going to often refer to Vedic Hindu, or sometimes just Vedic religion, because the first set of principles and the literature of the earliest emergence of Hinduism are in the Vedas. Uh, and the Vedas are four books uh, that, that document and um, register the rituals that have formed the basis to the present of Hinduism. Who is Hindu? Who has ever done yoga? So between declaring yourself Hindu and doing yoga uh, in your earlier days, it's all, it's all part of a spectrum. Because yoga is at the core from the very beginning of this Vedic Hindu set of practices. It is connected to the body, and thus the big theme of uh, this lecture has to do with uh, how the body, or at least in the first uh, site, the Manikarnika Ghat, is how the body is an instrument for mobilizing belief systems that expand out to have uh, very large uh, consequences. So here we are um, at the Manikarnika Ghat in the city of Varanasi. Uh, the post-colonial uh, name is Banaras, uh, but it's all the same place. This is a town It's very special. It is the most sacred location uh, for the Vedic Hindu tradition. Uh, it became such when, uh, okay, first of all, there are three gods, Brahma, um, he's the sustainer, I believe, right? Who's, who's, who's Hindu? Who's got this? I can't remember. Brahma, the sustainer, was uh, challenged to a yoga contest um, quite boldly by, um, no, Brahma's son, Daksha, who invented a practice of yoga, challenged Shiva, the creator, or Shiva, the destroyer. That's right, the nuclear bomb, Shiva, I am the destroyer of worlds. So Shiva, the destroyer, was challenged by Brahma's old son uh, to a yoga contest, to a style of yoga that he himself invented. And Adi Shakti was so embarrassed that she set herself on fire, killing herself. So she uh, engaged in self-immolation, and the grief-stricken, um, uh, well, let's get to that, that next one. We have a picture of that. Grief-stricken Vishnu uh, was so w took her small, still smoldering body off to the Himalayas. Parts of her body fell to earth, uh, establishing the 51 sites of Shaktiism. The most important one was her earring, which fell to the river Ganges on the shore where Varanasi is. And so Varanasi uh, was forever the most important place to be cremated, having your ashes spread uh, to the waters. And thus you see these smoky fires. These are um, the lifelong ambition of uh, Hindus to the present is to be uh, cremated on the Manikarnika Ghat or somewhere else along the, the uh, Ganges River in Varanasi and have their ashes sprinkled onto the river, thus almost guaranteeing uh, 
a pathway to nirvana and the end to the endless cycle of reincarnation and ongoing suffering. Um, and so uh, there is a ritual uh, that is performed repeatedly. Um, it involves on the Manika, Manikanika God, and it involves water. And um, the shoreline was a muddy bank for uh, many centuries, but over time, this has been a continuously occupied site for the last 3,000 years at least. Um, uh, Varanasi was spared in a in 450 BCE, when uh, the competing kingdoms were warring with each other, the custom was when you over when the 16 nations became one. Uh, when when you have the semifinals and you beat the opponent, you destroy their city. And uh, for some reason, Varanasi, which was called Kasi at the time, uh, was spared. And this is part of the creation myth of Varanasi that uh, Vishnu took pity on the city. of Varanasi and spared it. So Shakti and Shiva were the conjugal pair. Shakti and Shiva um, and, uh, and they represent water and fire and are represented in the Yona and Linga. Yoni and Linga symbols of uh, female and male genitalia. And so here we have um, the, the ritual of water from the Ganges River sprinkled on the linga, the symbol of uh, Shiva and the male genitalia, spilling down uh, with flowers into the um, basin, which is a symbol of the female genitalia of Shakti, uh, from where it spills out and flows towards the Ganges River. But the interesting thing about this architecturally is it's very simple. You do not need a temple. We're going to be seeing a lot of temples, but I'm not going to be telling you much about these temples until the second site, <clears throat> because right now we're focusing on the Vedic traditions of uh, the moment when the Vedic uh, rituals move from an oral tradition to a written tradition around 1000 BCE in Varanasi. Uh, the rituals become codified, recorded, and they are simple. And this is a revolutionary thing. And all of a sudden, these Vedic rituals are not just for the Brahmin class, the, the uh, priests, the priestly caste. Um, it's not for the Kasatriya, the nobility, the kings, and the warrior class. It is down even to the untouchables. It becomes a universal uh, religious system available to everyone. And so this was a radical thing. It doesn't require a temple. It simply requires uh, often a brick platform uh, because fire becomes part of the ritual as well. And so water and fire, it helps to have access to the sacred waters of the Ganges River. That said, temples do form. And uh, this is a temple form that uh, we'll be looking at at the second site. Uh, and we'll be trying to understand what accounts for this formal uh, proliferation and development in history. Um, for the moment, take a look at the complexity of the door and these niches down here, because we're going to be looking at that in some detail. And so all you really need is access to the water of the Ganges and, it, it, uh, and the platforms of the steps uh, of the Ghat. The Ghat is the landscape that is constructed leading from the city edge down into the water. And as the Ganges River rises and, fall it, and falls, we get this a dynamic landscape. And dynamism is one of the key themes of the Vedic Hindu tradition. Uh, and over the centuries, temples will form here. But the basic ingredients are some access to the Ganges River. And so you have these complex step gods that reach down to the water's edge. And sometimes you can have, um, if you can't get to the Ganges, you have ghats that are built all throughout India that are accessing other waters. Um, here is a temple uh, that is quite simple above ground, but there's a complication because it needs to go underground to access the waters. And so often there's 
a very deep well below these temples to access the waters. And you have, again, we've seen this before in the Buddhist tradition, uh, this uh, Chaitra that we called it in the Buddhist tradition. Here we're going to call it um, a mandopa. Mandopa. Um, it's a porch that is covered uh, in front of the sacred uh, temple uh, space. And so inside this temple, we have um, the Linga Yoni uh, symbols that are the focus of the, the water ritual. And uh, there's a, a prescribed sequence that involves uh, rotating. Uh, if you're doing it in the Ganges River, you do a salute to the sun, which you know because you've done yoga. And then you scoop up the water in your hands, and with your hands outstretched, you let the water spill back into the river Ganges. Then you spin around and um, take a dip, and that's it. And you are now on the path to uh, nirvana. Now, you can do that in the river Ganges. You can, if you can't get to the river Ganges, you can do it in one of these temples, and they, the temples go from the river Ganges across the planet. Uh, but some version of this ritual is available. And so here's the Manikarnika God. Um, I have the laser point. And you see the steps as they have formed over the centuries. And what start out as little modest little platforms for the uh, operation of rituals uh, proliferates and spreads. The most important spot is here. And this is the original Manikarnika God um, temple. Uh, it's quite small and humble, and um, again, we see an additive process. You don't make it bigger and bigger and bigger like you would at St. Peter's in Rome. You just make more and more and more of them, and then you interconnect them with uh, a pilgrimage route. So here we are again with this pilgrimage route. So the body is the focus of yoga. It becomes the focus of the basic Vedic uh, ritual. And now the body is moving through space from one ritual site to the next uh, outward uh, through a series of uh, circumambulations. So uh, it's interesting to look at the resonance between other things we've studied. The pilgrimage to Mecca in Islam, the pilgrimage network across the Mediterranean world in Europe of Christianity the ambulatory in the Christian church. Uh, and here we have similar operations uh, at the core of uh, the Vedic tradition. Now to help us along this uh, pilgrimage route, we have these picture maps that are exaggerations of physical reality, but they emphasize some things and de-emphasize others. For example, the uh, mosque that Aurangzeb uh, in the Mughal Empire builds uh, along the Varanasi Ghat is just one, it, it dominates physically at this at the, at the earlier times. Uh, the minaret towers have since collapsed. Um, but here we see uh, it, it being subordinated to all these other temples. And this is the one at the center. You start at the Mani Karnika Ghat and you end up at the Vishvara uh, temple. And it's in doing so, in taking this route uh, around and around clockwise, we recall that in the Buddhist tradition in Borobudur, we would similarly uh, walk in this clockwise motion uh, to in, a, in the performance of a mandala. So the human body is moving through space uh, through the story of the Buddha. Here, similarly, it's moving from temple site to temple site to uh, increase the power and the likelihood of getting to Nirvana. And these maps, uh, this is one from the 18th century. It shows the five rivers that contribute to the waters of the Ganges. And this is where we get into this pancha system. The word pancha is a Sanskrit term for the number five. And so you have the pancha krosi pilgrimage route that takes you through the Panchananda river system of the five rivers, the five Nandas. And uh, then you have 
the uh, and the whole thing together is the Panchaganga five waters of the of the uh, Gan Ganges River, and so this um, pilgrimage route is not just on printed maps, but because of uh, the scarcity of those and the inconvenience of having to have maps, uh, they would have built maps. And so the niches in, a, in any temple will be a physicalized map showing you symbolically through these little sculptural indicators uh, which temple to go to next. And in the performance of a ritual in any given temple, you have the ability to not go on the whole, oh my god, it's a long, it takes a long time, I got work to do. Um, you perform the pilgrimage using the instrument of the architecture as a way to go on the pilgrimage symbolically by giving offerings to each one of these niches in sequence. So in effect, you symbolically make your way all the way through the whole pilgrimage route, and you can do it in a much shorter time. Notice that sometimes the temple sites are represented by niches. Sometimes it's the other architectural elements over the portal, the door itself. Um, and sometimes in a quite complex sequence of, uh, of ritual offerings. So here we have yet another example of the architecture operating as an instrument for doing big important things. Um, the Vish Veshwar temple at the core of this was destroyed um, in later times, but we do have some drawings of what it might have looked like. But to the present, uh, the Ganges River continues to be a major uh, destination uh, upon the death uh, of someone who wants to make sure they can, wants to increase their chances of not being reborn uh, to the, all this suffering. Uh, and so the, the, the interesting thing is that sometimes these little platforms that started out uh, as little locations to do the water ritual or perhaps the fire ritual get more and more elaborated and then they become cells um, that become uh, available for these other rituals. And the pal it became prestigious to build your palace, not just temples, but also the palace in this case, uh, or schools, um, uh, or even the mosque uh, of Aurangzeb. Uh, but they become increasingly integrated, so it becomes an architecture in which the river Ganges itself, rising and falling in this dynamic a fluctuation of life, symbolizing the dynamism that is at the core of Vedic Hindu belief system, uh, concretized in architectural steps that register that changing level of the water, and then integrated with the architecture of the palace. And so you see um, hundreds of palaces and other buildings down the, the shoreline. Uh, here's the water ritual. Um, the Yogja, yogja, fire ritual burning, in which you take physical substances by sprinkling them into the fire, you release them from their physical nature and release them, their essence, into the smoke to, to offer it up to the gods. Uh, and so this is uh, very much a part of what's going on um, at the core of this. And you can see it's a very simple thing. You don't need a temple. Actually, it's better without a temple. All you need is a platform on which you can burn things. Um, here's uh, a, a step well, uh, and some of you have seen step wells across India. This is uh, one of the more famous ones, uh, where it's very far away in Rajasthan. You can't get to the Ganges River, so you get to the next best thing. And this is a place where these ritual, uh, Vedic rituals can be performed. Now the interesting thing is, these Vedic rituals have roots in common with the mythologies uh, that we have come to know through the Greek and Roman world that we'll be looking at on Wednesday. Because of this expansion out of Central Asia uh, steppe region of the Indo-Aryan um, populations 
as the landscape uh, became less capable of supporting larger populations, they would expand outward uh, to populate Europe uh, down to Iran, Persia. Though the country's name, Iran, was changed to reflect the roots in the Aryan races, um, and into India uh, over here. And so there are car common roots um, to these uh, mythologies that grow into the world religions. You see here, um, let's see if we can do this in that order, that we have these great societies that we have and will continue to look at. Um, we haven't yet looked at the Mesopotamian world, but we sure will. But this was a major population center of the Nile up through Mesopotamia, modern day Turkey, uh, over to what became Constantinople. Uh, here you see northern India, uh, where these traditions emerge, and then China. And what we see with the Indo-Aryan uh, migrations is the filling in of those blank spaces that suddenly, uh, in around the year 100 BCE, you start to get trade between China, India, and the Mediterranean world because of the Indo-Aryan filling in of these gaps. And there's a sharing of these religious traditions, uh, and they start to, uh, references to each other's religious traditions start showing up in China, in India, and in the Mediterranean world. So any questions? The Manikarnika got a Vedic Hindu tradition, um, some terms, Yes. Well, it's fundamental to the present, uh, the caste system. Um, and I'm assuming you know something about that, that um, the untouchables are the trash collectors that collect the, the waste from the sacred cows, and uh, it's used for burning. And um, it's a very strictly hierarchical social order uh, where you can go to India now and if your taxi driver uh, uh, is of a low caste, he can't ask directions from someone who's of a higher caste and so he'll send you in. Even though you don't speak the language, you, there's no common, you have to find someone and India has a lot of English speakers because it's the, one of the official languages of the country, but uh, even though you don't know how to interpret the answer, like go to this roundabout and then go to this landmark and turn left, you still have to go in because it's unthinkable um, that the taxi driver would be the one asking the directions of the hotel concierge because obviously the taxi. Yeah. I guess, like, is, it, is it outside of the urban regions? And also, how yes. do you know when you see someone? Like, how does a village, so you know, there are a lot of How do they, what are the signals? Yeah, yeah, how do you know? The signals are clothing, and this has come up previously in the course where they have sumptuary codes in Batavia where you're allowed to wear pewter buttons, but you're not allowed to wear brass buttons. Uh, you're allowed to wear shoes, you're not allowed to wear shoes. And so there's a, a, a code in dress, in hair, in other indicators, um, and if you can't tell right away from those indicators, you can tell from speech. As a matter of fact, it, it played a heavy role in the, the violence uh, that you saw at the beginning of Slumdog Millionaires. Um, if you were mistaken for a Hindu in a Muslim zone, or if you were mistaken for a Muslim in a Hindu zone, uh, they would kill you. And so it became very important to have those indicators well organized from a distance, because uh, you don't it's too late. If you wait until you have a chance to explain why you look, why you're dressed the way you're dressed, uh, it's too late. Um, and many people died through mistaken identity. So it becomes very important to wear your identity on your sleeve, literally. Other questions? It's decreasing, of course. And there are plenty of Hindu traditions where, like, we'll, we'll see one soon, where there's no caste. The caste system goes away. And that it's increasingly an aspiration of the nation state of India is to eliminate those caste barriers. 
magnification. Other questions? Good questions. Okay. Let's do that again. So we're zooming out from Varanasi, coming out, getting a quick glimpse of India, and zooming back in to southern India. Around there. Let's turn there. And so here we see this river valley. Uh, increasingly, we see the organizing, the geographic organization of these societies around rivers. And we'll have a lecture where that is the theme. Um, but increasingly, it is a river organized world. Um, so here we are at the Brihadeshvara Temple. Now, this is a tough topic. Um, it's a tough topic to teach. Uh, hopefully, I've, I've made it easier for you. It turns out that when people write about Hindu temples as an architecture, they say, uh, isn't it interesting how the Chatsvi has evolved? And they show you uh, three examples from northern India and four examples from southern India. And then they say, now let's look at the way the multiplication of these forms occurs. And we'll show you six examples from six temples that you haven't heard of yet. No overlap with the seven you looked at previously. And so the thousands of temples are all cherry-picked to show different examples of different features and characteristics of Indian architecture, of Hindu architecture. Um, no one looks at a single temple, it seems. Um, so the reason we're here at this temple uh, is not because there's a convenient literature about it. There's no convenient literature about this. Um, no one has taught this temple the way I'm trying to teach it. But it happens to be the key point of proliferation for what happens next in Cambodia and Southeast Asia. This is the Chola King. The, the cultural label is Tamil. And you'll recognize Tamil because that's the culture that dominates in Sri Lanka. Who's from Sri Lanka? Who's been to Sri Lanka? Who's from India? Who's been to India? Okay. Um, so this culture, the Chola culture, this Tamil Chola culture, dominates 2,000 years after the one we just looked at. So we're zooming way forward in history. Um, the Hindu temple as a type has been developing for a very long time, centuries and centuries. And so they have a lot to choose from, uh, and they make their choices carefully. So let's look at what they do. Um, first, let's refer back to what we learned in Sanchi about the Buddhist stupa. Here's a depiction of the key elements of the Buddhist stupa. Remember that the axis mundi is a fancy way of saying there is a vertical pivot around which the whole world and the cosmos spins. And we are self-centered by nature, and we like to establish an axis mundi whenever we have power and say, the world, the cosmos, spins around this point here. And then you get a, a proliferation of competing pivots. Um, and from uh, there's a comparison here. It doesn't emerge one from the other, but there's a comparison between the elements of the Buddhist stupa and the Hindu temple, specifically these two um, different traditions, the northern style and the southern style, which there's an endless literature on the details of this. We are only going to dig into it to the extent that this example allows it. So I can't tell you about anything that I can't show you. So here we go. This is the, um, there are three or four names for this temple. Um, so the one on the lecture sheet is the one we're going to use, but there's a lot of other versions of it. It's basically this king, and his name is Raja Raja. So instead of writing King Raja Raja, which would just add a level of ridiculousness because Raja means, what does it mean? King, yeah. So instead of saying king, 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 we're going to keep it at king, king, Raja Raja. Um, I don't think that's a reference to the Star Wars Raja Raja joke that they put in Star Wars. Anyway. Um, 
So this temple, um, King Raja Raja, around the year 985, I believe, what does it say? Oh boy, why did it do that? So he, King Raja Raja, gains power around uh, the end of the 10th century, and he does what we do when we gain power. We build a new capital city, and uh, we establish our power base in that new capital city. And he's doing it with this gigantic temple, the largest Hindu temple ever built. He breaks all kinds of rules, uh, and we're going to look at a few of those because reproduction with the difference is one of the things we really dig on in this course. So it's this vast temple complex. He, he builds it in a very short amount of time. Uh, he builds it in granite, not in the, the sandstone that more um, you know, wimpy kings would build it out of. He builds it out of granite, much harder to do. He replicates the Hindu cosmos. And uh, we've referred to this a little bit, but this lecture is where we really get into it. We already saw a diagram of the Hindu cosmos um, in Varanasi with the circles, the concentric circles. Uh, and we're going to keep seeing it because every bit of architecture uh, we're doing here is a reproduction in some form of the Hindu cosmos. And there's a reason for that. It's because it works. Uh, within the Hindu mindset system, you need to have uh, the, the abode of the gods, which is Mount Meru, um, at the center. And that's where the gods live at the center of the Hindu cosmos. And you need to have a mountain nearby. <clears throat> that is that Mount Meru. Then you need to replicate it in your uh, architecture. And so Meru, the mountain Meru, is at the center of the temple complex here in the new city, capital city of Tan, uh, Tanjavur, also known as Tanjore. Um, and so uh, you know that it's a mountain because it is clearly the biggest peak around. So this is the cosmic mountain of Meru replicated at the center of the complex. Now there's a very elaborate formal strategy. And uh, we have to be careful with our Western trained viewpoint to think, OK, I can make sense of this. I've done Gothic cathedrals. I've done classical orders. I can do this. OK, so there's this central element here. And clearly, it's being replicated and multiplied. And here's the pattern. I've decoded the pattern. Success. This is what an educated Hindu would immediately recognized because it is their culture. Wrong. The whole point of this is to lose track of form. This is the dynamic essence of the Vedic Hindu worldview, is that uh, the world is not stable. The world is dynamic. And in order to uh, replicate that, in order to exude that, in order to exemplify that, we need our architectural tricks. So what is the architectural trick here? It is staggering. And so we take a form, and then we uh, say copy and paste, uh, scale, uh, so you reduce it in size, and then you move it forward, and you merge the forms. Uh, any of you who use AutoCAD are going to recognize this vocabulary. They would have a button on their AutoCAD machine where it would be pre-programmed. They make one form, they push the button. And it, the subroutine operates in the script would automatically copy, paste, reduce, stagger. Copy, paste, reduce, stagger. Copy, paste, reduce, stagger. And when you put all that together, you get this thing that is basically shimmering. It's a form that shimmers. You can't, it doesn't stay still. It seems to oscillate and move um, through all this replication of form. So there's the recognizable core. Uh, of the facade of the temple. And talk about difference, normally it would be a single one-story element. Here, uh, they're not happy with one, they're not happy with two, they go to three. Um, which is a special thing that 
Raja Raja offers his people as Vishnu's he, he his on top of his head was Vishnu's feet, and that was the belief. And so he had this direct contact with Vishnu, and he would share this. So uh, Western scholarship is filled with these types of let's make sense of this, let's break it down. It's very complex, so give me something simpler that I can understand. Well, that kind of misses the point because, and let's do this, let's see it as a, a progression, a development from simpler forms to more complex forms. Well, the whole point is that by the time you get here, you don't recognize any of this. This is formfulness. This is maya or moyo. I don't know my Sanskrit. Here's... No. Um, in Javanese, they would say moyo. Uh, and so you're supposed to recognize these roots of basic form in this complication. Not so much. It's supposed to look really complex. It's supposed to not even be stable when you look at it. It's supposed to vibrate, uh, vibrate with the energy of all creation. So here's one of the Gopuro gate, gateways. It's a five-story gateway. Again, this very complex multiplication of form at multiple scales filled with these little figures. If we were looking at the Gothic, or if we were looking at Hagia Sophia, we'd say, ah, dematerialization of the form. <clears throat> it takes what appears to be solid and makes it seem uh, not so solid. Uh, here it's a similar thing, but it's about vibration. Um, here we look at the synchronization of the uh, the elevations of this site, where this 16-story, um, way taller than anything before or since, uh, the, v, v, the Vimana Tower, um, and there's always two words, there's always the more familiar um, Hindu term, and then there's, because it's Tamil, there's a Tamil term as well. Um, so Shikara, uh, Vimana, it's all the same. <clears throat> Um, and so you see that the way, how did they build this? They actually built a ramp. Um, we figured out that uh, a mile, over a mile away, there's a piece of earthen ramp that comes up uh, pointing at the top. And the speculation is that elephants were used to pull these granite blocks up this earthen ramp up to the top um, to get these huge, heavy stones to the top. Uh, it's not a single stone at the top. It's actually multiple stones. Um, so uh, it's not as impossible as some people would say. But the sequence of gateway gopuros uh, leading into the complex uh, are synchronized. Not so much... Uh, the, one of the mythologies is that uh, the shadow of the central uh, Vimana Tower never hits the ground. Wow. Not so much. That wasn't really the point. It was really about sight lines, and that's what um, we see here, uh, that there were sight lines that were synchronized in this. This was not such an additive thing. This was conceived all at once and built in a very short period of time, and this is one of the ways we know that, it's because it is so carefully uh, synchronized. Here we see this multiplication of form. We see the inner chamber of uh, the, uh, the linga, where some relic statue would, would exist in this central sacred space of the Garba Griha. And then there's the Mandopa porch in the front. And so you see, uh, again, this increasingly elaborate um, uh, development of that. In this case, um, the front porch is still quite simple, but it's extended in two pieces. And then these inner porches get more and more elaborate. And it's almost like Borobudur. They start with fairly simple forms on the outside. And as they move in, the moldings and the columns become more and more uh, vibratory. The, the sun, uh, the, this vibration uh, increases as the forms get more and more refined. And there's something inside called the new chola, chola, chola style that is characterized by these columns with multiple facets, octagonal, 
um, and these square elements, uh, mid-shaft and at the capital. And so this is characteristic of the new Chola style of the column form that is elaborated in greatest uh, detail on the interior of the mandopo as we move in. And on either side of these walls, the uh, sacred objects would be lined. Here you see a cutaway drawing of the outer and inner mandopo. Now here's one of the big moments of truth for this site is that we've talked in the past of how the lower story, uh, we saw at Songye Pagoda, the Buddhist tradition, which shares a lot in common. You see the, um, the griha, the garba griha at the center with the linga here, and you see this ambulatory corridor, and the upper stories, as on the exterior, are not for going up there. You don't go up there. It's not like Bodo Gador. Uh, for those of you who've got that question on the quiz, you don't go up there. It's just you visually see it and you project yourself mentally into those upper stories. But here, Raja Raja says, not anymore. I have this friend, his name is Vishnu, and I am a benevolent king. I'm going to bring him to you. So he brings us this upper story gallery where we get to actually experience the multitudinous nature of earthly reality. Uh, we're not stuck on the earthly plane. We get a glimpse of heaven. We get a glimpse of the multitudinous nature by experiencing the parallel universe of that upper level that has never been built prior to this uh, moment. And we elaborate the form on the ceilings. We elaborate the form in these gavat. Gavaksha door pediments. Uh, like at Borobudur, the portal, the entryway, is the moment of truth where you uh, transcend one reality and move into the next. Uh, and the whole thing put together, um, also as you might expect and will be seen over and over again, there is a multiplication of uh, galleries that are available for um, using art not just on these upper stories, but now in the galleries, uh, we get to experience this narrative pictorial storytelling um, in the surrounding galleries. And so here we are, there's both uh, uh, denotation through verbal, there's verbal denotation, and pictorial narration through uh, the artwork uh, throughout. And so on the outside, uh, we get these series of panels like we saw in the Buddhist tradition. Um, you get a representation of the hundreds, uh, some would say over a thousand uh, people working at this temple to keep it going, keep it lit, keep it clean. Um, this temple supposedly had 600 people just taking care of business, and on top of that, 400 dancers to perform these rituals in this open courtyard at the center. Um, and here you see a depiction of some of the dances uh, depicting the, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata epic stories of um, the Hindu culture. You guys know the Ramayana and Mahabharata? Have you heard of those stories? Excellent. Uh, excellent batch of stories. What was that? So here's the Linga at the center, the biggest um, Linga anyone could ever hope for uh, at the center. Constant ritual of water and fire. Uh, here you see that um, two of these levels are occupiable. This one is a misrepresentation. You couldn't really occupy that third level. But again, you could look at it and say, oh, you could aspire to that next level of the heavens. Um, now this is an interesting depiction of Shiva that was produced by the Rajaraja Chola Empire, where you see this multiple dimensions of Shiva as um, uh, embodying the three char the characteristics of the three gods, um, creator, preserver, destroyer. Uh, the drum uh, of one hand is setting in motion the vibrations of all creation, so that vibrating nature. Uh, the the gesture, uh, the reassuring gesture of the upward pointed fingers. I pushed the wrong button. 
Um, upward pointing fingers say there's nothing to fear. That's one of those mudras that the Buddhists use. Um, the fire of destruction is invocated. There is a troll of ignorance and illusion that is being trampled underfoot. So it's filled with these cosmological ordering symbols that uh, are the way that uh, kingship makes this happen. Here's a representation of Raja Raja and his um, admired teacher uh, from whom all these uh, Hindu teachings uh, come. And the interesting thing is that Raja Raja sets up this developmentalist uh, system where the Koville Temple, it's a Tamil word for, uh, for a place of the gods. The Koville Temple is not a place you go to worship on Sunday like a church. It is the center. Once again, we're being challenged to think of a world in which there's no separation of church and state. No separation between uh, everyday life and finance and banking. And, and uh, the Coville system, is, the Coville temple, this architecture, is the center of the uh, Chola Mandalam, which is the Chola world vision. And so it was conceived of uh, as a system in which all administrative functions of every village would be organized by a central administration based in the temple, including uh, access to investment. So businesses could uh, get funding to, uh, uh, and farming activities could be funded. It also had a, a squadron of engineers who would move throughout this network, bringing knowledge of engineering, especially irrigation. And so the Chola system proliferated through the series of temples planted in every village wherever they went, became a developmentalism, uh, developmentalist approach to expanding the empire and the wealth of that empire. And so the vassal states of the Chola empire uh, extended up the coast and um, went across to uh, modern day mainland Southeast Asia and then through the archipelago uh, to Java and beyond. And so our next stop is um, going to bring us to that. But in the meantime, we have the thousand year anniversary of the inauguration of this temple. And so they brought those 400 dancers and then some to reenact the dance that would have occurred, they think, in that courtyard over the centuries uh, for the last um, thousand years. Thank you, dancers. Any questions on this? As we zoom out, find ourselves over Southeast Asia and back into Cambodia. Who's been to Cambodia? You from Cambodia? Here we go. Help me out. <laughs> Pronunciation. So here we are, uh, Angkor Wat. You say Wat or Wat? Uh, what? What? Angkor Wat. Okay. And uh, the largest religious structure in human history. Uh, vast. And it's not just this one complex. Uh, they kept building more and more of them. And we keep getting challenged by things we find in this forest. And we keep getting challenged to upgrade our estimate of what kind of urban population could have uh, existed in what is now jungle around uh, these temple sites. And these really were temple sites. The, one of the mysteries of Angkor Wat is uh, that we don't find cooking utensils. We don't find garbage heaps. We don't find the shrapnel of daily life. And so there must have been some kind of major uh, fluctuation of population in and out, or a lot of um, food trucks that come in and take away the waste, because we're not seeing what we, what we, used, what we usually see. Um, again, the Chola, the Chola uh, Empire uh, extends its operations across um, the Indian Ocean to this site, 
And so you find a mountain. Step one, find a mountain that you can call Meru. Find a river that you can call the Ganges. Find a, a large body of water that you can call the endless ocean of Indra. Well, we got those things. Here's the mountain. Here's the river Ganges. We have multiple rivers, and they all feed into the Mekong River. So again, we have the kind of Panchananda system of the five rivers that we saw in Varanasi that is the template for creating a new center of the universe, of the cosmos. So water is at the core of this. Um, Mark Yarzenbeck does a fantastic job uh, presenting this. I'm using a lot of his slides, you'll see, that this none of this is possible without this aggressive water system. Uh, they build this complex in a similarly uh, overnight way. And of course, the mythology, this is common to Borobudur, Prambanan, which we'll see later, um, uh, the temple at Tanjabur, and this one, there's the mythology around it that the, the ruler, uh, with the help of the gods, built it all in one night. Well, maybe not, but pretty damn close. You know, in, a few, in a decade or more, there's a lot of stone to move. So again, we see the familiar proliferation, multitudinous of form up the Mount Meru that was built in the center. This is the stone cosmic mountain establishing the axis mundi of the universe uh, once again. And this very high point, um, yes, these are Buddhist monks uh, because in later centuries it converted from a center of Hindu uh, religion to a center of Buddhist religion. And so, yes, there are Buddhist monks um, in the neighborhood using this. Um, and so it is a mandala, it is a cosmic instrument. It's filled with these galleries, uh, all containing the artworks, the narrative pictorial denotation that tells the stories of creation. The inner chamber of the Garbhagriya, um, where the linga is kept. Uh, it doesn't have the multiple uh, galleries like we saw at Tanjabur, uh, but it does have um, this vast elaboration of columned corridors and spaces each one corresponding to a specific caste. Um, uh, the royal family would be allowed in the center. Uh, the priests would be allowed in the next layer out. But it was a caste system that was a very steep caste system. It was really ruler's family, priestly caste, and then everybody else. And so out there beyond the priestly caste, um, it was flattened. And it became uh, a much more socially egalitarian uh, system, but this extremely steep um, staircase to get to the top, uh, so it was an occupiable space up, up in the upper chambers, um, and you see here that stair going up. But this um, remarkable uh, proliferation uh, of sculpture in stone, this vast uh, complex. Here you see the Gavaksha portals uh, up here, and we have uh, the Naga balustrades. The Naga is very important in terms of the mythology, the creation mythology, where the Naga, Naga means serpent or snake. And so the hooded Naga um, is, uh, is a symbol that is, uh, proliferates around the site. The story is um, that the hooded Naga, Shisha, is the only thing left from the previous cycle of creation and destruction of the former universe. And so Naga is, the, this Naga is the last remaining element left over from a prior reality. Um, and Vishnu uh, reclines on the coiled body of this Naga, and out of his navel, comes this lotus flower, I hate it when that happens, and uh, you have uh, Brahma, who then creates the next universe. And so the importance of this Naga is celebrated throughout the Angkor Wat complex in these very long balustrades that kind of surround the whole thing. And these are all narrative uh, galleries, this one facing outward, and then others that face inward, um, to here. So this vast infrastructure 
framework for all of these narrative panels. Here you see more of the Naga, this endlessly long serpent in the balustrades. Um, there's more of it. And there's uh, the temple on axis. Connected across the vast ocean of the water, of the moats and the reservoir system, this island, the central island of the Hindu cosmic universe, um, is where uh, all of these narrative panels would be appear would appear, and here they are. Um, this is the churning of the milk ocean, one of the most famous panels, um, where another again a serpent. Uh, what they need to do is they need to churn up the the milky ocean so that they can get the treasures that are submerged in that ocean. So they do what any of us would do. They take the island of Madura. They use it as a stirring stick, and somehow it's, it's, this island is connected to the serpent, and so they have a tug of war. And Vishnu can't, you know, the gods can't do it alone. So Vishnu takes a big risk. He invites all the demons of the underworld to grab one side of the naga. So the demons grab the head, the gods grab the tail, and by pulling back and forth, they stir up this milky ocean. And uh, sure enough, that dislodges the water enough for Vishnu, um, pretending to be the beautiful Mohini, to sweep in when the demons aren't looking, switch out this elixir with alcohol, some probably rice wine. And so the demons get the rice wine, and they get drunk. The gods get the elixir of immortality. And that's how we got to where we are, of course. And so these narrative panels uh, include also a depiction of Surya Varman, whose name means uh, the shield of the sun god. And so Surya Varman, uh, as Raja Raja uh, was before him, is very full of himself. And he presents himself as being uh, Vishnu. And so he's often appearing in these, playing the role of Vishnu. Um, now let's quickly move on to, um, here we see the narrative galleries, some of the great art, um, both inside and out. Once again, very Chola-like. Um, so the connection between these two sites is very strong, where you have these beautiful narrative panels of uh, uh, and you can trace the artistic qualities between the Chola site and Angkor Wat. Um, it later becomes a, a Buddhist site, and so you get this proliferation of Buddhist form. And then in Angkor Thom, you get um, the actual face of the Buddha uh, in the temple itself. Uh, very eerily coming out of this multitudinous shimmering of form, uh, you get the face uh, in it. Um, and so we move out from the center to this vast water system that Professor Yarzenbeck has identified uh, as being crucially important. Part of this developmentalist approach of Chola uh, Empire of taking a place where you really could never support a huge population and by these remarkable engineering feats of you really have to figure out what the lay of the land is, you need water levels, you need to figure out how far the, the earth pitches, and then you need to build these vast, at the time, the largest ever uh, reservoirs um, system so that you can irrigate vast uh, landscape to support the huge population that must have been here. I couldn't find uh, an image of the uh, urbanization of this area. But here you see the multiple rivers feeding into the Mekong floodplain. Uh, you locate your city just above that floodplain, and there is a zone that can be irrigated from these vast reservoirs that you construct. And these reservoirs are like six kilometers long and two kilometers wide, um, just huge. And we're still discovering things with satellite imagery, uh, infrared imaging of the forest, of the, of the jungle. And we're picking up these, these network of roads, of, of paths that, that structured what must have been just a huge city. Um, and there's more than just Angkor Wat. There are these 
all these other sites that uh, we could look at as well. And we see um, the Chola expansion continues down to Java. One of the ambitions was to control, as, as I mentioned, um, in the, the second century BCE, there starts to be trade between China and, and India over land and then onto the Mediterranean world. Well, that continues, as we know from the rest of the course, to become a water route of the trade between China and India. And these Straits of Malacca once again show up as a crucial uh, geographic feature, the moment of truth in this trade, the place where you can choke it and control it between modern-day Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Sumatra, which is part of Indonesia, and the island of Java, the most fertile of the sites. Any questions about Angkor Wat? You're zooming back out. Now we're heading back to Java. And um, I just have to uh, put this on. So there's Borobudur, uh, Gunung Merapi, the volcano. And off to this side, the village of Solo, which becomes the location of the uh, Palace Surakarta. Who's from Java? Who's going to Java next month? Oh, cool. Don't miss it. So here we are at the Palace uh, Surakarta. This is something quite recent um, in this story, but it, it does something nice for us in the course. It shows how uh, it kind of, if there was any doubt, you know, architectural historian tries to periodize history, tries to say, here's the Renaissance. Oh, it's over. Here's the Baroque. Ah, over again. And you have to end something before you start a new thing, especially in the 20th century. Um, it's very confusing if you're paying attention to reality. Um, and this is a case where education gets in the way of your understanding of the world. It's not always like that. There's a certain continuity. We're going to move very quickly. There's the tower devoted to the Queen of the South Seas. Not Hindu, Javanese. The Queen of the South Seas, she's the one who um, led Prince Senopati to her kingdom in the bottom of the South Seas uh, and fell in love with him and made a deal with him. I love you so much. I will follow you. I will support you. I will support your descendants. Every king of Java will have my support. And so much of the rituals of this palace uh, involve renewing that conjugal union between the king and the queen of the South Seas. Here we see another depiction. Here's the clearest diagram yet of Mount Meru at the center of this concentric system. We saw the diagram uh, at Varanasi. And it gets very, very elaborate. Rather than look at it in the diagram form, we can look at its translation to the structure of the palace. We could do this at Varanasi with the pilgrimage routes. We could do it at Tanjavur uh, in the structure of that temple complex, Angkor Wat similarly, uh, but here also. Here it has the advantage of actually operating as an instrument. Uh, it is not just a model of the hindu javanese cosmological order. It is also a model of the Javanese kingdom. Uh, and it's not just a model. It's a pusaka talisman. It's an instrument. When something goes wrong, when a volcano erupts here, you perform a ritual at the location in the palace that's associated <coughs> with that location in the kingdom. So it's like a voodoo doll. Stick a pin in some one place and something happens in that in the associated part of the realm. And so you see it playing out uh, along these ceremonial axes. One thing worth pointing out is that this orientation down here, which is this is supposed to be the endless ocean of Indra that we saw at the other sites, uh, but its alignment points directly at the tower devoted to the Queen of the South Seas. So it's simultaneously a Hindu cosmological order, but it's worked into it this acknowledgement that the Javanese uh, pre-Hindu conception of the world 
And the whole place is filled with these types of things. The most powerful king uh, of recent times is the 10th. He rebuilt the palace. And just like his uh, predecessors syncretically uh, fused uh, the world of Hinduism with the world of Javanese religious system, he, as royalty of Java, uh, in a moment when the Dutch have colonized uh, the island of Java, he does a similar trick. He doesn't want to be wiped out, and the Dutch don't want to have to wipe him out. He wants to work with the Dutch. The Dutch want to work with him. So he says, I'm no longer the political leader, but I will take care of business internally. I will be the spiritual leader. Uh, he takes all these metals, these trappings. He's got a sword uh, that his Dutch uh, colleagues would uh, recognize. So there's all things in this costume that shows indications of syncretic fusion between Dutch and Javanese elements. Uh, this is Javanese up there, this whole thing. Um, but we continue to see stuff like this. There we see the Dutch governor general and uh, a more portly version of Pakubuono X. Uh, here we see Pakubuono X in a Dutch military costume uh, with the uh, king of Siam, King Chula Long Korn uh, of Siam. And similarly, uh, Thailand is another place we could look at with this amazing fusion of European and Thai uh, cultural architecture. Now, the cycle of rituals continues to the present moment. When something's wrong in one part of the kingdom, uh, an earthquake, a famine, uh, they perform certain rituals. Uh, the cycle of repair of the buildings, which I was involved with, uh, you have to do certain things. Here's an example. The carriage that was a gift from the Dutch Queen Wilhelmina around the end of the um, uh, early 20th century, late 19th century, this Baroque carriage, um, if the caption weren't there, you'd see, you might see this little offering down there. And there's one here. Every, every eve of Thursday, Thursday is a sacred day, but every eve of Thursday, an offering is placed because <clears throat> this is not just some Dutch carriage. It's been Javanized. It has Pusaka, spiritual power, and if you don't perform the right offerings, you, you can have trouble. Um, the sacred dance is allowed to be rehearsed once every Javanese month, every 35 days. And then the night before the uh, anniversary of the coronation of the king, uh, where he renews, he goes up to the top of that tower devoted to the Queen of the South Seas, where he and the Queen of the South Seas renew their conjugal union uh, to renew the favored status of the Javanese people in the eyes of the Queen of the South Seas. For that um, ceremony, the Abhidhalam, uh, the servants of the palace, throng in, there are thousands of them volunteering, uh, wearing the ribbon to indicate that they are friends of the Queen of, uh, of the King, and thus will not be harmed by the, the army of the Queen of the South Seas. Um, here is the central pavilion where the Pusaka elements, spears, uh, spittoons, golden items, uh, the, all these sacred items are kept here in this treasury. Once a year, paraded out uh, and covered uh, because um, we need to know, it's important to keep it a secret what the predictions for the coming year are. So you cover up the Pusaka, some of them, and you parade them around um, the, the palace. Uh, here's the version of that. Some offerings being made. And here's the sacred dance, the Doyle Katawan. Uh, this is the first time it's ever successfully filmed. All previous attempts were banished, and then for several decades, every time the team tried to film it, something would happen to their equipment. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Then there was a fire, and some people said it was an electrical problem. Some people said it was uh, the 
um, the wrath of the Queen of the South Sea. She was unhappy about something. From this moment onward, Pacabuono the Twelfth uh, never slept in the palace again. He always stayed in a hotel because that was the very sacred heart of the palace that burned, sparing the tower of the Queen of the South Seas. Um, part of the rebuilding, you take a tree from the north, another tree from the south. It's a lot like the Issei Shrine, um, that it is a wooden architecture. It is renewable. That's the uh, Pacabuono the Twelfth. Um, and uh, the nobility, the princes and princesses, and the reconstruction of the um, dining hall, um, Merapi. There's a continuity here. Uh, there's a, a Hindu temple not far from the Sri Rijaya uh, period, one of the largest Hindu temples in the world. There is this interesting, this last uh, example is where the Hindu uh, Balinese architecture that when Java was Hindu, they would have had the same architecture we see today in Bali. Who's been to Bali? Yes. Awesome, right? Um, so they take the Hindu form and they make it a mosque when Islam comes. And this is the Grand Mosque in Surakarta. And here is the, the celebration of uh, Muhammad's birth. And in typical Javanese style, they take the linga, the Hindu linga, and yoni symbols. They festoon it with the symbols of the Indonesian nation state. They parade it through the palace. They take it to the mosque. And then they rip it apart because there's sacred power associated with these offerings. Very non-Muslim, but this is a Muslim holiday. It's all mixed together. You say, is this a Muslim holiday, or a Javanese holiday, or a Hindu holiday? Uh, and they say, I don't know, what do you mean? Why do they have to be so different? Um, and so this is, uh, you see Baroque architecture of the palace. You see the brass band. You see the Middle Eastern fez. You see the sarong of Java and the tuxedo tails coat. And in order uh, to pull off the tuxedo tails coat, you, you have to wear a sword if you're going to wear the sarong. You've got to have your sword with you. But the tails kept poofing up. So the prince took the scissors and cut off the tails, and that became the standard ceremonial costume of royalty, a classic example of syncretic cultural fusion. It was Javanized. So these things were all Javanized. Um, and it looks right. It looks like a brass band. But they don't really know how to play. The medals, the swords. Oh, enough of that. So we saw this before. Um, when we were at Bandung, the tensile operation of the architecture, um, me checking that out, uh, trying to puzzle it through, and then uh, looking at this tower, the Queen of the South Seas, um, rebuilding it with the architect priest Pa Asma, um, and the ongoing reality of very human be uh, playing these sacred roles. Um, and the present king uh, is very human. This tragic, farcical thing is being accused of drugging underage girls uh, and raping them. And uh, will soon end his days in jail, I hope. Um, so sorry to end it on such a sour note, but that's um, reality. Any questions? You excited to go visit? Thank you. It's a great town. Okay. Thank you, everyone.